the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the run. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the uh, day five of uh, the Summer of Student Aging 2015. And we'd like to welcome everybody on VTEL land. Uh, make sure that your mics are in the back position. We really appreciate that. And uh, once again, uh, we're here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, the Audi L. Uh, Murphy VA Hospital uh, in the heart of San Antonio, uh, San Antonio Medical Center. My name is Joseph Aka. I'm with the South Texas GEC. And along with my crew, uh, Mark Johnson, taking care of the, uh, the video, Barbara Giles, taking care of the signing, our number one volunteer of the year, uh, Marie Brendel. And uh, thank you uh, for attending today. Let me go over some, uh, some real quick paperwork. Uh, first of all, is anybody here a uh, uh, not employed by the VA? Who is not part of the VA? Okay, for those who well, you you've been here always, so you know the drill. Oh, yeah. So you, I'm not quizzing. You should know by now. Okay, it's real simple. Uh, I've got instructions uh, on on the board here, but if you're, if you're not part of the VA, you're not employed by the VA, and you want your VA credits, uh, depending on which ones you want. Anything other than social worker and LPC, uh, and you want those kind of credits, um, you have to fill out this non-VA registration form and turn it in the back. Uh, anything else, uh, I'm here to answer any of the questions pertaining to uh, CEUs. And, um, and we kind of streamlined it a little bit better uh, this time around, so hopefully uh, you'll get your CEUs in a much uh, uh, quicker uh, response session because uh, we had some issues last year, but this time, uh, you know, going through the evaluations and uh, getting them to you should be much quicker. Uh, another thing is the uh, 2015 uh, CD DVD order form. If you want a copy of the video, the PowerPoints, and some photos, uh, fill that form out and turn it to us at the end of the conference day. And here are your non VA instructions. Of course, if you're not part of the VA, I'll go ahead and pick this up and I'll kind of like uh, give you a step by step instructions on how to uh, turn in your CEUs. And this is our uh, person with profile. It's a front and back demographic profile. Please fill that out as much information as you're comfortable with. This is, uh, helps us secure uh, grant monies to uh, bring to you these free slash uh, low cost uh, educational uh, uh, sessions to you, uh, such as this five day one at a uh, low cost. So uh, definitely that would be much appreciated. And of course, uh, again, my name is Joseph Fata. If you have any questions pertaining to CEUs, uh, I'll be in the back, trolling the halls, uh, just let me know, and uh, police, I'll definitely try to help you out any way possible. Okay, well, our first speaker is uh, Sandra Fox. Uh, she's part of the VA now. She used to be a UT, but she defected. And uh, she's going to be talking about the AG9. And then she's going to be followed by uh, Melba Perez, talking about uh, giving a continuation on that topic. So please uh, help me in welcoming uh, Sandra Fox. can do it.
got everybody going. <laughs> now I got to turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. Oh no, this is the best part. <laughs> well, I wake up early. <laughs> Trying to turn them off here. There we go. Come on, Pharrell. I love Pharrell. Anybody else in here love Pharrell? Oh, come on. Maybe we'll just have to mute. He's too happy. He's too He's happy. happy. <laughs> come on, I can't get it off. <laughs> yeah. I got it. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> well, that's my talk. <laughs> Before we get started, um, I did want to say how happy I am to be here this morning, even though it is early on Friday. But I did want to inter introduce two young ladies that will be finishing their residencies um, in uh, optometry, and that would be Dr. Putnam and Dr. Bentley. And the reason I'm introducing them is because they're joining us at the VA. Dr. Putnam will be going to the eye clinic in Kerrville, and Dr. Bentley is going to be with us here over at Data Point. So we're it's been wonderful to work with them for an entire year almost, and very glad to have them joining us. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the aging eye. And the reason we <coughs> want to talk about this is because there are a lot of misconceptions about what's normal and what is not normal. Up here, okay. And there we go. So just kind of a little review about what the eye looks like. I think everybody's seen this picture. And the interesting thing about the eye is that if you want to, we have a, isn't there a laser pointer? Yes. Middle. Middle. Top. Top. Ah, there we go. Okay. There. Oh, it's green. Well, that's nice. So when we're talking about the eye, there's all these areas where light has to travel through. It has to, of course, go through the cornea, through the pupil, through the limbs, through the vitreous, and then eventually it focuses on the back of the eye, on the retina. And so if you have anything in this pathway that's going to obstruct light passing through, you're going to have some difficulties with vision. And we're going to talk about a, little, a few of those things that can happen. And then this is just a little bit better picture. So see, these are the things that normally change as we mature. Um, visual acuity, accommodation, visual field, light sensitivity and glare, contrast sensitivity, adaptation, color sensitivity, and dry eye. So th these are normal changes. So what we're going to talk about first are the normal changes that occur, and then we'll talk about some of the things that do lead to vision impairment. Visual acuity just refers to our ability to be able to see detail and objects. And we know this. You know, it, it, has everybody in here had an eye exam? I, I sure hope so at this point. Good. Um, so when you do, do the eye exam and they ask you to read the line of letters on the chart, that's just visual acuity. And really that's only one part of vision, but it is the one that we measure the most easily. Um, uncorrected visual acuity begins to change around the age of 50 as people tend to become more farsighted. Um, as we get older, we can have some neurologic changes that occur in the brain, so that visual acuity involving fast-moving objects tends to decline. And that's one of the reasons why driving starts to become a little bit more risky as we get older, because we're just not able to spot things as quickly. The main thing is, a drastic decrease in visual acuity is not normal, and I think that's very important. Because in years past, before we had the kind of eye care that we have now, when people would go blind from glaucoma and cataracts um, and other eye diseases that we can now treat, people would lose their vision naturally as they got older. And there still is that thinking that, well, you know, I can't read the paper anymore, but that's normal. And one of the take homes with this is, no, it's not normal. There's something else going on. <laughs> Accommodation is the ability of the eye to focus on objects at, at near. And that, that starts to change right around the age of 40. We start having difficulty. In, you know, if you've never worn glasses before, then you start to notice that you have to push things further away in order to see them. If you've always been nearsighted, you find yourself taking your glasses off to be able to read. And that happens to everybody. There's no stopping it. No matter what you do, no matter what vitamins you take, this is going to happen to everybody. But it's easily corrected with either glasses or um, reading glasses or bifocals if you're a nearsighted person. 
visual field refers to peripheral vision. So that we all have very good, most of us will have pretty good peripheral vision most of our life. Um, the size of the visual field does decrease by one to three degrees per decade. So by the time people get in their 70s or 80s, they can have a total visual field loss of anywhere from 20 to 30 degrees. And so that again is where we run into trouble with people in driving. Because when you're driving, it's really your peripheral vision that's going to keep you from getting in accidents, keep you from hurting somebody, than your visual acuity. In fact, and in some states, um, on the driving recommendations, or not recommendations, but requirements, visual field is a requirement that you have to have X number of degrees. In other states, visual field is not even a requirement at all. Some states, visual acuity is not as big a requirement as visual field, and that's really probably a safer way to go. Light sensitivity is glare and caused by opacities in the lens and vitreous that increase the scattering of light. As, we, as the lens inside the eye starts to change, that can cause increased glare and light sensitivity. The other thing that can happen is when people have cataracts, they develop very slowly over time, and then when the cataracts are removed, and now they have this clear lens inside, they can also have increased difficulty with glare. Sunglasses are very helpful with glare and light sensitivity. However, um, a lot of people, as they get older, do not do as well with the really dark sunglasses. They do better with different tints, maybe an amber tint or a green tint. And so truthfully, the best way to determine what color is going to work best for a, a senior citizen is, is actually going to be a, a glare sensitivity test where we can look at different tints and find out what works well. What we're looking for is a tint that will decrease the glare, increase the contrast, and not decrease the visibility. So these sunglasses on this fisherman, oops, those are fine because young guy out fishing, probably polarized, but for people that are older, that might very well cut down on their visibility. So what would be a problem with somebody wearing sunglasses that are too dark out walking around thinking about somebody that's an, an older individual? What kind of problems would that cause? Falling. Yeah, tripping over curves and steps. And I mean, you know, that's the, that, that's the worst thing that can happen to a senior is to fall. So we really don't want them to have sunglasses that are too dark. A lot of them will come in, and the sunglasses they're wearing are the little ones they got after their cataract surgery. You know, that's the sunglasses. And, and those, those things are really dark for a reason. So they're almost always too dark for them after their surgery. Contrast sensitivity is the ability to recognize detail even when the detail is very faint. So, you know, if uh, you know, lighter ink in the newspaper, when they started, when newspapers started running into trouble, one of the first things that they did was they started using less ink in the paper, and all the seniors were very upset about that. And then they also, then to get more on one page, they made the, the font smaller. So smaller, fainter font brought a lot of people into the, in the eye doctor's office because they couldn't read the newspaper anymore. Um, contrast does decrease with age, and it's thought that it's due to a decrease in the number of neurons in the visual pathway. The yellow tinted lenses can be really helpful for that. They call them shooter or driving glasses. Um, and so I, I, I recommend that my patients try those. And of course, in the office, we can try them as well. And, it, and they can make a significant difference in improving contrast. It's a little bright in South Texas for people to wear those during the day, but on overcast, cloudy days, those can be very helpful. And then also lighting is very, very helpful as well, and, and, and Ms. Andrews is going to talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Dark adaptation is the ability of the eyes to adjust to changes in light levels so that you know, when you're in the movie theater and, and then you go out or you go out and you go in the movie theater, that seems to be the one that's a little bit harder. And as we age, this, uh, these adaptations occur much more slowly and we think it may be due to changes in iris muscle function and pupil size and also due to the development of non-cataract capacities. Um, this is the sad one. I noticed this myself. Ambient light needed for reading by people in their 60s is three times that needed by people in their 20s. And you know, this started with me maybe about 10 years ago when I would read at night before I went to bed. And I noticed 
that I was starting to get closer and closer and closer to that little nightlight that I had over to the side because I just couldn't see it. And I actually have a flashlight app on my um, iPhone that when I go to restaurants, I am the most popular person at the table, <laughs> if they're my age. Because, you know, all that, all that light, you know, the ambient light that makes us look so much better in the dark is not really very good for reading. And that really is a, if once you experience it, you realize that is very, very true. Wearing transition lenses or shades outdoors can help the eyes adapt more quickly. So if you're wearing those wraparound shades and you come in and take them off, it's much a quicker adaptation. So that's one of the things that we do with a lot of our seniors. The problem with the transition lenses in, in hot climates is the transition lenses do not work as well or as quickly in, in the heat as they do in the cold, which is not good for us here in San Antonio because, by golly, it's hot. Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay, if, if the um, ambient light for people in their 60s is three times greater than those in their 20s, what is it like for seniors? <clears throat> Well, it's darn hard to read unless you have really good lighting. And, and Ms. Andrews is going to talk, what we've talked about it when we, in our clinic, that if we had to have only one tool for our low vision patients, it would be lighting. And that is, it's just really important. How many, is, does anybody in here do home health? One of the things that was wonderful when I started working with Ms. Andrews is that she can go into the patient's home. And, it, and we would dispense low vision devices. They would do great in the office. And then they'd get home and couldn't use them. Some of them live in caves. You know, they're so dark. And they're too dark. So, and I, I'm not quite sure why that is, but it is something that Ms. Andrews encounters all the time. I, 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 she's probably spent hundreds of dollars buying lamps for people on her own. Because it's just, oh, they just need, when she just runs down to the Hobby Lobby or a dollar store and gets them and takes them back. Because it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue, and certainly something I think that we can discuss. I don't know how many of you, I've been, my, my dentist, his, his ambient lighting is so dim in his reception room that you can't even read in there. At least I can't read in there without using my little flashlight. And, and I think that that's really common. We did a project many years ago where we went into ophthalmologists' offices just to talk to them about how their reception rooms were not very well equipped for people that couldn't see very well. Uh, you know, how many, when you go to the doctor, what's the first thing they do? They hand you a form to fill out. Yeah. And if you don't see well, and, and that form is in small print, sometimes very small print. And, and so really, even people that should know better, that deal with eyes, that know people can't see very well, even their offices are really not well thought out for people that have vision problems or even older people. So you can imagine restaurants, places like that are certainly not, not very well thought out. And that's, a, a, you can ask a question at any time, any time. We don't have to wait to the end. Although we will ask <laughs> questions at the end too. So the ability to distinguish colors also declines with aging. The cone cells, and we only have three, blue, green, and red, are responsible for color vision and all three decline in sensitivity. Colors are less bright, and contrast between colors are less notable, noticeable. And when, when the, the cataracts, really from the time you're born, you're developing a cataract. Because the, cat, the lens inside the eye is crystal clear when you're a baby, and you know it just gets a little bit more yellow as you get older. So this change in color vision is very, very, very slight, and you don't even really notice it. So that when people have cataract surgery, that's one of the things they'll say, oh my gosh, the colors look so much brighter. So, so unfortunately, that is, the, that is also a normal change as well. That could be why as we get older, we wear way too much rouge and, well, rouge is not even the word anymore, it's blush. We use way too much blush and eyeliner, you know, because especially if you're farsighted and you're looking in the mirror, you, you really, it's just kind of a blur. So, you know, they're doing the best they can. <laughs> it's kind of easy for me. I can usually tell what kind of vision my patient would have walking in the room if it was a woman. You know, I, I can usually get a pretty good idea about where she stood on the visual acuity scale. Now, our tear production may decrease with aging. I'm a, I should take that out of saying it just does. And, and a good way to think about it is, is that just not like our skin gets drier and our hair gets drier, our, our, our eyes get drier as we age as well. And it is worse for women because of hormonal changes as well. The eyelids become looser so that the tears may spill over the edge and not be pumped like they need to be. 
So, but, but that's fairly easy to treat with artificial tears, prescription drops now, we, we do pump the plugs, and even the omega-3 supplements are all sub thought to help with dry eye. So everything I've talked about up till now, you know, there, there are things that we can adapt for, we can compensate for, we can make a difference, and, and you know, if, if, if you need more light, you use more light. If your eyes are dry, you use drops. Uh, there's just a lot that we can compensate for. So let's look at the risk factors for vision loss. Uh, genetics or family history, that is probably number one. You know, a, a lot of the eye diseases that occur or heredita are hereditary. So if you have family members that have lost vision from glaucoma um, or uh, diabetic retinopathy or whatever, your chances of, of developing those diseases are certainly greater. Accidents, injury and poisoning, aging, high blood pressure, medical conditions like diabetes, some medications, and substance abuse like alcohol, tobacco, and illegal drugs. So if you look at the risk factors, there are certainly things we can control, right? I mean, it, we don't have to drink too much or smoke. Smoking is huge. I mean, it really is really, really, really bad on the eyes. Um, some medications, you know, they can't always change your medications if it's something that you need to keep yourself alive, but, but there are alterations that we can make. Um, medical conditions as, such as diabetes, we can do, do what we need to control our diabetes. High blood pressure, same thing, it's hereditary, you may get it, may not be totally, un up, not up to you whether you get it or not, but you can certainly do whatever you can to keep your blood pressure under control. You can't help getting old. I mean, that's one of those things we just are not going to be able to help. Um, and you can't help your genetics or family history. You can't help accidents, but you can be very careful about injuries and poisoning. So of this list, there are a lot of things there that we really can control. And so that's my recommendation when patients talk to me about what can they do to keep their eyes healthy. You, you keep your body healthy. If you want to keep your eyes healthy, you keep your body healthy. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. So the big four eye diseases in industrialized nations that we have to worry about are macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. And cataracts, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy are considered diabetic eye disease because they're much more common in people that have diabetes. So we do see a lot of that. We'll talk about macular degeneration first. It is the leading cause of vision and vision impairment in Americans older than 60. It's a degenerative condition of the central area of the retina, which is called the macula. And the macula is the part of our retina that gives us our detailed vision. It's, it's the high resolution area in our retina. Um, it causes severe central vision impairment. 1.6 million Americans over the age of 60 have advanced macular degeneration, and it is one third of all cases of legal blindness. So this is, this is the big one for people over the age of 60. And this is what a this is what a healthy retina looks like. And this is the macula. It's an avascular zone right in the in the back of the eye. This is the optic nerve. And so when you when you have a nice healthy retina, you have a nice healthy eye, and you have good clear vision. This is what happens with macular degeneration. You get this. You can see that that's called geographic atrophy. And so you get this area of the macula that just gets destroyed. And when that is destroyed, then it causes this blind spot right in the middle. So when people, a good way to think about it is if you make a fist and put it right here, and then as you look around at every person that you try and look at, you can see all around them, but you can't see them. And that's what macular degeneration is like. So these people can function pretty darn well because they can get around well. So they can fool you. And I have to say that a lot of seniors will not own up to vision loss, especially if they live by themselves. Because they're afraid that if their family knows that they're having difficulties with their vision, then they will be sent to the dreaded nursing home. You know, and that's like the kiss of death. Nobody wants to go to the nursing home, and so they'll, they'll fool you. So their effects on daily life, they have difficulty reading and, ability to, and an inability to recognize spaces. So they don't like to participate in social activities. They become much more reclusive. They have difficulty with distance and depth cues, so they have difficulty getting around, so this leads to falls. And then they have loss of color and contrast, and then that's going to interfere with a lot of their, their activities if they like to paint. You know, a lot of people when they get older, and that's the, the, what I think is the sad thing about this eye disease. You know, you work all your life, you can't wait to retire so that you can do the things you want to do, paint, crochet, read, you know, learn how to use a computer, 
And then what happens? Then you develop this eye disease that makes all those tasks much more difficult to do. Not impossible, but certainly more challenging. Now, cataract is a leading cause of blindness in the world. And although it shouldn't be a significant cause of blindness in the United States, and it's not, it is responsible for 50% of mild vision impairments. And that's because under Medicare guidelines, you're not really supposed to do cataract surgery, or it's not covered under Medicare until your vision's 2050 or worse. And now, that was not an issue. It's all, that's always been the rule. But I'll tell you what really changed was Medicare reimbursement for cataract surgery went way down. So surgeons are not real quick to do cataract surgery anymore. So they will wait until it's 2050. But does anybody know what, what your visual acuity has to be to drive? 2040. Oh, shoot. Yeah. You, it, you, you have to have about 2030 vision to be able to read the newspaper. So 2050 is debilitating. And yet, they will, we did, we did another project several years ago with our low vision coalition where we went and, and did vision screenings at senior apartment complexes. And I was shocked at how many patients I saw with pretty significant cataracts that were told by their doctor that their cataracts, their cataracts weren't ripe yet. Who even, that's, who even uses that term anymore? <laughs> it's like a melon. Sorry, I don't hear it in there. So, um, and, and again, if it's affecting their activities of daily living, it's something to be considered. And we can get around that by doing some additional testing that, that shows that their visual acuity drastically decreases in glare. And if you can show that, then it's covered. So it's just a little bit of work. Um, it is a clouding of the crystal lens inside the eye. And like I said, it's happening very slowly. Some cataracts are, most cataracts are very, very slowly progressing. Some are not. Um, diabetes, people with diabetes are twice as likely to develop cataracts, and they can develop them at a very early age. I've seen diabetic patients have cataracts in their 20s, so they can get them very early. The, the effects on daily life, trouble with glare and contrast, and reduced acuity. The first thing people will complain about is driving at night, is they're having trouble driving at night. So this is what it looks like. This lens, this is a dilated pupil, and that should be a, an optically empty space, but that yellowish, brownish, that's the cataract. And I like this one because this is a young person, probably a traumatic cataract, but this is what it should look like, and that's the eye with the cataract. And it just makes everything blurry. And again, because it happens slowly, a lot of people don't really realize it's happening. There are 2.2 million diagnosed cases of glaucoma, and there's just that many that are undiagnosed. And glaucoma, we used to think that it's being just high pressure, but now we know it's a progressive optic nerve disease that has a particular pattern of optic nerve damage and visual field loss. Um, people with diabetes are twice as likely to develop glaucoma, and it is the leading cause of blindness among African Americans. The effects on daily life, difficulty with reading and mobility due to visual field constriction, because that's what happens with glaucoma. It affects the nerve fibers that provide us with our peripheral vision first, and so you start to get the slowly progression of decreased visual field, and again, by the time people realize, it's too late. Optic nerve disease is not correctable. It's treatable, it's not correctable. And so what ends up happening is, by the time they come in, that visual field loss they have, that's what they've got. Um, this is just a slide that shows how, this is the optic nerve, and we, we look at this cup to disc ratio, so the, so the optic cup is in the middle. And this just shows how different it can be. And so it varies from individual to individual. What's normal for one person is glaucoma in another person. So glaucoma is not my favorite thing, as these young ladies know. It's really not a really, it's not black and white to try and decide if somebody has glaucoma or not. And I think that that's the important thing. They used to do these visuals, they do vision screenings, and all they would do is they would just check the pressure inside the eye and with that little puff and tell people they didn't have glaucoma or they did. And you cannot do that anymore. You have to look at your visual field. You have to look at the optic nerve and stereo. You have to measure the thickness of the cornea. You, we now do um, um, uh, optical coherence tomography of the, of the nerve fiber layer. You have to look at all these things, the, the angle of the eye. And then after all of that, you have to make a decision. Do we treat this person or do we not treat this person? So to me, it's, it's a very tricky disease. So this would be an optic nerve that, again, this may or may not be glaucoma, depending on the results of all those other tests. 
In one person, this would not be, and in somebody else, it very well could be. But what happens is, is this peripheral vision loss, so they end up with tunnel vision. And again, with glaucoma, the earlier it's diagnosed and the earlier it's treated, the more successful we are. If this person, if this person already has glaucoma, then this disc is going to be a much more difficult disc to treat and keep from getting worse than somebody that was detected earlier on. So it is one of those diseases that we try and detect as quickly as possible. Yes? Uh, what what uh, is the criteria that makes you do all those tests? Because obviously you're not doing that every year on everybody that goes to you. What we do every year is we dilate the eye and look at the optic nerve and we do check the pressures every year. So say we get somebody and their pressures are a little high. Then we do, we measure the thickness of the cornea because that can affect the pressure. So if the pressure then, if, if we find out, oh, well, their, their pressure is just artificially high because of their cornea and their, and their optic nerve looks good, we're pretty much done. But if the optic nerve is suspicious, their, their pressures are suspicious, then you have to go on and do the other tests. What's normal pressure? Or what, what's the, what's the, uh, the pressure? Criteria? About 20 is where we get, if it's over 20, we start getting a little bit more confused. But what, what medications they're on can make a difference as well. So, I mean, it's really not an easy thing to, to treat or di diagnose. Either one, diagnosing and treating is not easy. Do antihistamines have a uh, tendency to bring the pressure up? Anything that can, if, if somebody is at risk for angle closure glaucoma, which is a different type of glaucoma, any, any drug that can dilate the pupil can make them at risk for angle closure glaucoma. So if you check, there's gazillions of them. Gazillions of them. That's my, that's my medical term, gazillions. <laughs> now, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in industrialized nations and people between 25 and 74. And that really is a sad thing because it, it affects people that are working and takes them out of the workforce, and so this is a very expensive disease. The retinal blood vessels break down, leak, or become blocked, and then you get um, neovascularization because the, the retina's not getting enough oxygen, so these new blood vessels grow, and you would think that would be a good thing, but they're very fragile and they can break, so it's not a good thing. The statistic that, that to me is the most scary is that one in every 12 persons with diabetes over the age of 40 has vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. And I worked for five years at our diabetic eye clinic, and we saw people all the time walking in, getting di diagnosed with, with um, diabetes for the first time, and already had diabetic retinopathy that needed treatment. So it's, it's huge in San Antonio. I have to say, after being gone from that diabetic eye clinic for about eight years, and then I went back when one of the docs was on maternity leave, it is better. You know, in that amount of time, it has improved. And I think a lot of it has to do with educating the primary care providers. Because now primary care providers, when they diagnose someone with diabetes, they send them for an eye exam right away. And I think that that has saved a lot of vision. So this is what happens with diabetes. These blood vessels become, and of course, if we see this in the eye, this is happening in the heart, in the legs, everywhere else. So when, once we notice it in the eye, then we know they're in trouble. And so you can get these little areas of leakiness and then you also get areas like this where there was blood that leaked, but the blood has resorbed and this is just the exudative material left behind. The thing is, is if this was the person's phobia right here, that person could still have 20-20 vision and would never even know they had anything wrong with their vision. Well, then what happens is they can get all these little blind spots. Everywhere there's one of these areas or blood, they're going to have a blind spot. Now, if they didn't have a blood spot right there, they might not notice it. You know, with both eyes open, they might not notice that they were missing parts of their vision. Then you get these little blood vessels. These are the little fragile blood vessels that, well, now this person's got poor vision, I can tell. But that's what happens. When those blood vessels break, then you get this horrible hemorrhage, and that's when, that's when the vision is really bad. So it's a, it's a terrible disease. It leads to neovascular glaucoma. It's just, it's just a bad disease. But, but most people have type 2 diabetes, and it is controllable. So, you know, I think that that's the area where we have issues. So what happens with this happens? They have difficulty reading and recognizing faces. They have increased sensitivity to glare, and that occurs very, very quickly. So um, even before I noticed retinopathy, I would have patients complain, complaining about glare. 
They have difficulty with light dark adaptation, difficulty with distance and depth cues, loss of color and contrast, fluctuating vision, and big one, difficulty with diabetes self-care. Like if they can't see very well, we, we're telling them they need to monitor their blood sugar every day. How are they going to do that? You know, how are they going to see that? How are they going to draw their insulin if they don't see very well? You know, I had a patient one time that had very poor vision, and I asked him who drew his insulin for him, and he said, well, I do it myself. And I said, well, how is that working out for you? And he said, well, I was in the hospital twice last month. So, you know, and we don't think about that. Even in our diabetes education classes, we don't think about that. Nobody thinks to ask, well, can you see that? And the truth is, probably not. So, so uh, that's one of, one of the reasons why we talk about this, is so that you can all go back to your areas and be aware that if you have someone with diabetes, they've probably got something going on. So we have other causes of vision impairment, congenital ocular disease, retinal dystrophies, injury to the brain and eye, and stroke. And we're not going to talk about that in this, in this particular talk, but there are other ways, that, especially seniors. A lot of seniors will have some vision issues because of stroke, and, and that'll be another talk. So what is low vision? It's any chronic visual deficit that impairs everyday function and is not correctable by eyeglasses, contact lenses, or surgical medical intervention. So the so these, these, you know, people will say, well, I'm legally blind without my glasses. Well, no, 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 no. Legally blind means even with glasses you cannot see. So according to Webster, rehabilitate means to restore or bring to a condition of health or useful and constructive activity. And so it's the process we use to train someone that's lost a physical function and allow them to be able to do their daily tasks. It is goal-driven and it does require a multidisciplinary approach. So in low vision, rehabilitation, the physical function that's been lost or compromised is vision. So the goal of low vision rehabilitation is to teach the person that has lost their vision how to perform daily tasks with reduced visual function. So it's no different than if somebody has diabetes and, and they lose a leg. So if they lose a leg, then the first thing that happens is they get a wheelchair so they can get around. Then they refer them to a rehab facility where they're going to get an occupational therapist to work with them on their daily activities a physical therapist to work with them on getting around. They'll probably recommend counseling because this is a pretty significant loss, um, a support group perhaps, and you know, over time they'll get fit with a prosthetic leg if they're lucky, and now it's back to rehab to learn how to use it. And in the end, the person that couldn't walk is now walking. A little differently, but walking. And low vision rehab is exactly the same, although we tend to not think of it that way. Somebody that has lost vision we have to put them through that same process. So the first step is the low vision, um, the low vision evaluation. And our purpose is to determine what their level of functioning vision is because we need to use that for the entire team. If we, if we want to know how we can help them, we have to know what their vision's like before we even start. I love this quote. This is actually by a woman that's vision impaired and very well known in the low vision community uh, as an educator. <coughs> She says, the ultimate goal of most people is to enjoy a high quality of life through mutually satisfying interpersonal relationships and meaningful contributions in a manner that allows them to value themselves and to be valued by others, family members, friends and neighbors, and society as a whole. And when you all say that that's your goal for yourself, right? Or if you have children, that's what you want for your children. But when people lose their vision, the first thing that happens is they feel like they're no longer contributing. And not only that, they feel like they're um, actually a drain on their family. They feel like they're a burden, and we need to get them to where they don't feel like that anymore. So that is our goal. My job as the low vision optometrist is to assess the clinical visual functioning, match the treatment options to the stated goals. This is what they want to do, um, and so I need to figure out a way that they can do that. Um, I prescribe optical, and some non-optical, but mostly that's Ms. Andrews that talks about that. And then usually serve as the coordinator of the low vision team so that once I know what their vision is like, what they want to be able to do, then now I know, okay, these are all the different services this person is going to need in order to achieve those goals. It is different from a conventional eye exam, and it does take anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes with an extensive history. Um, we do the functional tests like you get in a regular eye exam, but they're a little bit different. And then we discuss the rehab plan and determine what other resources they need. So of course we're going to look at visual acuity first, but our charts are a little different. You know, most of my patients can see the big numbers, and sometimes that's the first time they've been able to see something on an eye chart in a long time. And so that makes them very, very happy. 
We use the large targets. We allow the patients to move their head in any way they need. We use whatever is more appropriate for them, whether it's numbers, letters, or symbols. And we always measure single letter and text because sometimes they can read one letter at a time, but they can't read continuous text. So you're getting false information. Then we're going to want to figure out, do we need to change their glasses? Um, I would say in our clinic, we probably did 75% of the time. Not all low vision people work the same way, but we did find that many times just a little bit of change in prescription can make one line difference on the chart, and that's huge when you're vision impaired. So um, what we need to find out is can we get their vision to be any better? Most ophthalmologists, and a lot of our referrals are from ophthalmology, their staff are the ones that do the which is better one or two part, and they are not really able to, to work well with people that are vision impaired. It's very time consuming, so they don't do a very good job just because they're not trained in that area. So we do, and we tend to use this trial frame here rather than getting behind that thing because it's just a lot easier for the patient. And we use the little lenses. It makes it easier for them to tell a difference. We also allow the patient to hold their head in any direction. When you get behind that piece of equipment, you really can't do that. So if they have that blind spot in the middle and they have to turn their head this way, we let them turn their head that way. It is important because we need to know what their best corrected visual acuity is. And that's because that's what is used for, for services through Division for Blind Services, Lighthouse, even the VA. Then we look at the peripheral vision, and I tend to use something called a tangent screen because it's really easy to use. You just, I can actually use a laser pointer and just do this. Or there's a little wand, there's a little tiny spot you can't see, but we bring it in until the patient can see it. This is what we typically see with somebody that's had a stroke. They can see it on this side, but they cannot see it on that side. So it's a real quick test. And I like it because it's very functional. It gives me an idea about how they function. And it's good because the family members can see what's going on as well. For central visual fields, I use something called the California Fletcher Central Tangent Test. It's a really quick test, very sim similar to that one, where we're using a laser pointer, and they have to say every time they can see it. So this person had macular degeneration, and when I flashed it in this central area, they could not see it, but they could see it way out here. So it's a good way to determine if they have a blind spot. And now we have something called microperimetry that gives us an even better way, more sophisticated way to determine what their blind spots are like. This one is a machine that can, it can help us pick up very tiny little blind spots that we would normally not pick up. And this is a picture just showing that this person had a, a big blind spot in this area right here. Then we do color vision and contrast sensitivity testing as well. And this is how I, um, like I said, when I'm ch testing for the tints, I have them look at this chart and flip different tints, and they always have to be able to read the same le uh, line of letters. If they can't, the tint is not right. And like we talked about before, color vision is necessary for activities of daily living. We can't really improve it, but we can certainly compensate for it. And then poor contrast we talked about earlier as well. I do, in a low vision evaluation, my job is not to diagnose. My job, they're, they're usually being seen by somebody else. So I do a quick internal and external ocular health evaluation just to make sure that they don't have something urgent going on where they need to go back to their eye doctor for that. Um, then, once I've done all that, again, they've told me what they want to be able to do. I know what their vision is like. Now we have to start talking about what's a reasonable goal and what is not a reasonable goal. And so sometimes a, a, reasonable, a reasonable goal is going to be reading. Sometimes driving is not. And then we can start talking about what we're going to need to do next. At this point is where I will usually refer my patients to Ms. Andrews, the occupational therapist, and then she will have all of my information, and then she is able to then start working with all the information I've gathered and, and help the patient get back to doing what they want to do. And that's going to be the part that she's going to talk about next. Um, I think that's it. Do we have any questions? Before we move on, yes? When you're choosing the proper sunglasses, is it, is, is adding the polarized going to be beneficial at all? We have a set that has polarized, and for a lot of patients it does make a difference. Because of the glare? Be, I think what it, it does, and, and it sharpens contrast. Okay. You know, it just sharpens contrast a little bit. So, so we give them that option. Any other questions? Yes? What are your thoughts on laser? 
laser treatment for cataracts. They're really, you know, that's. So I just wanted you to say, okay, there we go. I didn't even have to say anything. People think cataract surgery is done by a laser, but it's really not. Um, it is a very simple procedure. Um, so I don't even really like to call it cataract surgery anymore because it's more of a procedure, but it's really not done by a laser. It's a little echo emulsification thing that's like a vacuum. Well, it's more like a jackhammer and then it sucks it out. Right? A small jackhammer and then it sucks it out. But, but people think it's a laser, but it's really not. Any other questions? Yes. I'm going to let Ms. Andrews address that, okay. and she, I'm sure she has slides. <laughs> yes? You know, it, when, you may have addressed this, but with like retinal tears uh -huh. that are repeating, and maybe there's some bleeding or something behind there, right. how, how, is, how do you deal with that? Well, when we dilate the eyes, we usually pick that up, or if the patient has symptoms. And it, it, we do have a retina specialist that works in the eye clinic, and they're not all treated the same. It just depends on where they're located, um, and it depends on what, if it's just a retinal hole, and they're not, and they're pretty sure that it's stable and it's not gonna go anywhere, they may just monitor it. But those are usually treated with laser. So, um, if there's a potential, you know, maybe it's not stable. If it's potential for tearing, yes. and becoming a detachment, it's treated with laser. So, for instance, if you have it up here, it's gonna get treated because gravity is going to pull it down. Any other questions? Yes? Do all cataract removals have lens implants? Most do. If they don't, there's a, there's a reason why. Because if you, if you don't get the implant, I'm old enough to remember, I think I've shared this with my residents, back in the day when we didn't have the implants and people had to wear the really thick cataract glasses. Those are horrible. So the only reason they would not put an implant in it would be a medical reason. Or, and probably the medical reason is, has caused such poor vision that, that it wouldn't make any difference. Yes? When somebody already has an attached retina, is there now a, a way that they can reattach? Yes, yes. Oh, great. We can, now, it depends on how early it's caught. Okay. And if it's detached in the center part, vision's probably not coming back. But if you get a detached retina out in the periphery and they catch it and they and they and they reattach it with either laser or scleral buckle, they can certainly save vision. Any other questions? Oh, good. Oh, one more. How's macular degeneration treated? Well, there's. I didn't have time to go into the different types because there's two types of macular degeneration: wet macular degeneration and dry. We don't really have anything for dry right now. For wet macular degeneration, we use injections. Um, they're anti-vasoendothelial growth factor to try and stop the little blood vessels from growing. And I have to say, it's not perfect, but boy, it has really made a huge difference. We don't see the 21,000 vision anymore for macular degeneration like we used to. Because what would happen, you know that blood I showed from the diabetes? That would happen, and so instead of just losing that central vision, you would lose lots of vision. And we just don't see that anymore, which, it's an advancement. Not perfect, but an advancement. I think. Yes? What about when the, the blood uh, doesn't get reabsorbed and just have those black spots that kind of go around your eyes? Like you know, that's not fixable, and that's the problem. Um, and, and it's because the retina is nerve, and so we are not able to regenerate nerve cells yet. You know, if they ever get to the point where they can regenerate nerve cells, then, well, you know, then I'll be out of business. <laughs> because, you know, all the, my brain injury patients will be treated and my low vision patients. I'll just be done. I'll have to retire. So that would be a great day. But um, right now, and that's the thing about the eye. You've got to catch it early. Because if you catch it early and we can keep it, the, the vision loss from occurring, we're in good shape. Once the vision loss has occurred, if it's damaged to the, if it's damaged to the retina in any way or the optic nerve, it's not coming back. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, you may have already addressed this, and I walked in a few minutes late. Uh, do you, uh, does, do, do floaters increase with age? They do. And it's because that, that first, go back here to, that very first picture that I showed you of the eyeball, uh -huh. the eye gets its shape because of this vitreous gel. 
So this is a gel substance. And it's pretty, pretty thick, almost like jello, you know, when we're young. And as we get older, it liquefies, sort of like when, when jello's left out. And there's strands and fibers in that. Once it starts to liquefy, <coughs> they start moving around. And so that happens as we get older. Okay. So they do become more frequent. Okay, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. I know. <laughs> yes. Anything else? I just wanted to, I, I have one little second, so I wanted to show this one last slide. Because I just wanted to, I want to keep going here. Oh, what's going on? I'm just going around. There we go. I just wanted to throw this slide up there to show that it really is a huge team that we use. Um, and the people we, that are the most important members of our team is the person with low vision. And I think that that's, all of us that are in healthcare, we have to remember that. I sometimes forget that my goal is not the patient's goal always. And so the first thing I have to do is find out what they want, and then we have to work from that. And then of course the eye care providers, education rehab specialists, vision teachers, rehab teachers, social work is very important. Uh, psychologists and counselors, support groups are huge, 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 huge. And then also all the allied health personnel. So this is a huge team that, that we use. I'm fortunate at the Polytrauma Center now that all those people are in-house, and it's just such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful blessing to be able to have that. With what we had at Lions Low Vision, it was op op optometry, ophthalmology, and occupational therapy, but we do work with all those other people that are here in the community. So I think that that is it, and I'm going to let Rainy Ann come up. Rainy Ann, come up. Burning toast and food. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine. The Parthenon and moments on the Hudson River line.